A great morning to one and all present here. On behalf of the Center for Medical Electronics, CEG and I, University Chennai, I welcome you all to the final day of the Atal Academy sponsored FTP on wearable devices. It gives me immense pleasure in introducing the speaker for today's session, Mr. Siddharth Nair, CEO, Expinito Bios Designs, Bangalore, Karnataka. He is a researcher and technopreneur trained in biomedical engineering. He has completed his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Sri Ramakrishna Engineering College, Coimbatore in the year 2011 and master's degree in medical electronics from CEG campus Anna University in 2014 and currently pursuing his doctorate in medical device innovations and sustainability at, at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore since 2016. He aims to develop cost-effective designs with multidisciplinary research focus around the field of healthcare technologies, robotics, electronics, and automobile. He is an active member of various techno-social communities and enjoys sharing his experience with budding professionals and entrepreneurs. He has worked in various multidisciplinary projects and has won multiple awards and accolades for his efforts as an engineer as well as an entrepreneur. His areas of interest are assistive robotics, cognitive healthcare technologies, medical devices, Internet of Things, affordable and accessible healthcare. He has filed two patents titled Combinational Therapy Using Customized Multiple Stimuli Based on Individual Human Physiology for Chronic Pain Management and Automated Stainer. With a passion for accessible healthcare, he founded Frista Innovations in late 2012 where he is involved in design and development of Relive, an innovative platform for tele-rehabilitation. He has recently started his latest venture, Expinito Biodesigns, in May 2019, which works towards solving critical global health problems with affordable and accessible solutions, with the initial focus being to solve diabetic neuropathy, which affects about 100 million people worldwide. Also, he is involved as investment partner at Campus Fund with a mandate to support student entrepreneurs in their exciting journey. He has diverse research interests with focus on health technologies, robotics, and automobiles. He envisions to solve various socioeconomic problems by developing cost-effective and innovative solutions. We are very happy to have such a highly dynamic personality amongst us. May I now request Mr. Siddharth Nair, CEO Expinito Biodesigns, to deliver his lecture on the topic Product Experience and Design Thinking for Wearables. Please, sir. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for the kind, kind introduction. Uh, firstly, uh, thanks to the, uh, to the organizers and the university for inviting me uh, you know, to share my experience around product experience and uh, especially looking at design thinking as a solution of how to solve this problem. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, so uh, I, I hope my voice is clear and every can he everyone can hear me up, uh, right now. Uh, so just when we look at this topic, it may look as a very non-technical and, you know, probably more towards the design aspect uh, or aesthetic aspect of the product, right? But guys, uh, let me uh, bring down some uh, some things to you. Of course, this looks like non-technical, but it's part of engineering. And uh, when I say engineering here, we are talking about uh, one specific field called as human factors engineering, right? So it's it's one of uh, I don't know if people know about human factors engineering. You will know about ergonomics for sure. So ergonomics comes under human factors engineering, right? And it's one of the most sought out roles. And when it comes to designing a product, uh, it's very critical. However, unfortunate fact is not many people uh, are specialized in this kind of a field, right? And again, human factors take in a lot of uh, shapes and forms. So today we are going to sp uh, speak on certain aspects of that. And that's where product experience come into picture, right? So, uh, so basically, that's a gist of what we are gonna do today. So today's uh, lecture, rather than just uh, me talking about uh, theoretical stuff and a lot of other things which you can find in internet, what I thought is uh, I'll have more case studies for you, and uh, we'll take you through examples which can help us understand this topic better. 
and at the end of the session i'll also let you know why i chose this topic specifically uh, and uh, to to address in this forum so uh, i hope uh, Uh, we are good with that and secondly if any question uh, in any uh, uh, in any uh, anywhere in the topic please feel free to ask uh, i'm not sure if your mute is uh, if your mic is enabled if not please put it in a, put it in chat probably saminathan sir or uh, one of the organizers would uh, give us the question so yeah so with this let's start this uh, lecture today so guys uh, when it comes to product experience why it becomes very critical and uh, one of the major reason uh, why we have to look at this is because this known but unknown phenomena called as technology rejection okay uh, it's been some time since people are working around this area of technology rejection and trying to see why people reject technologies right and uh, my professor professor muntumuni uh, was the co-author of this particular paper uh, you can always have a look at it uh, through sage publications and they are beautifully mentioned of the various reasons with respect to users why they could actually reject a technology right and uh, to be frank uh, technology rejection is not merely the negation of its acceptance it's not just about the acceptance it's lot more of, uh, more than that which comes into picture and uh, that's what uh, actually drove the whole uh, idea of product experience because uh, when, uh, see, uh, leaving off technology for a while and getting into product uh, so basically product is the subset of the technology right so it it died out of the technology so a lot of products were actually made in the market and it was getting rejected and specifically a lot of variables were also involved in this picture right so now companies had uh, com industries and research had a scenario where they had to understand why it is failing and that's the whole idea of technology re technology rejection coming into picture in the first place so looking at it uh, as per the paper you know they were looking at some factors which would which leads actually to technology rejection and the paper uh, did a lot of literature review you know some interviews etc and they found out these five factors which are majorly involved uh, or a major reason of technology rejection so one and i'll give example for each of these factors uh, with some known examples actually so that becomes easy for us to understand so one is uh, technological complexity second is technology fatigue third is level of flexibility fourth is altering user base and fifth is switching cost and loss aversion right so these are the five factors now if we look at deeply each of these five factor let's look at first technological uh, complexity now when it comes to uh, technological complexity why it may fail or why people may stop using it right so in this example i uh, now for this five examples i'm switching away from variables and i'm giving you general examples so when it comes to technological complexity especially people who understand uh, software and people who have worked with linux specifically ubuntu or any other form of linux as such uh, that's the best example of technological complexity it's a beautiful piece of software a beautiful os it allows you to do so many things but if you look at a general user right it is too complex for them to actually use the os well enough right because every time they have to remember a command or something like that right it becomes very difficult for them to understand however linux how it started and the way it is that today ubuntu there's a lot of changes within that as well however it was so complex that many of them rejected is the technology that doesn't mean it is a failure but it just means that it could not attract the crowd that it wanted to attract right so that's one of the example of complex so if you keep your systems complex it it's going to happen in the that people will go for your alternate solution even though the alternate solution may not be as elegant as your uh, you know your solution maybe so that's the first reason why people may reject your technology second is technology fatigue now best example for technology fatigue i would say uh, is probably facebook uh, when facebook started and when it was going through a lot of people were using it right uh, many people still use it there is no doubt in it but people who used you know 7 years back 
are not as active in facebook anymore as you know uh, the new new users are there of course uh, but those people who they got bored of all the storyline you know all the news feeds people being happy blah blah right and then they started to switch on to probably instagram in other of uh, social media right because people start getting bored of the same thing again and again and again and again right so you need to keep having your uh, 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 system which is interesting enough for them to keep uh, excited about it right so that's the reason why technology fatigue becomes one of the areas where uh, technology rejection can happen third is level of flexibility okay so now uh, here it's this is an interesting example because it's a big debate when it comes to level of flexibility and uh, the best example for that is apple right now apple always believed in closed ecosystem so they were not flexible enough for you know other things to interact and the whole platform to be developed around it you know they were not interested in that they wanted to build their own unique way system and things like that fair enough it gives a good product experience for sure however it is not flexible enough so many users who can still afford it yet want this flexibility may not come down to uh, apple products right so that also can happen so that's also uh, a factor of technological rejection but as i told you none of this factor means that it's about the product failure okay it can still fourth is altering user base so if you look at altering user base best example that uh, i can think of is blackberry right so people from enterprise usage start uh, used to use blackberry a lot because the platform was secured it was not as adaptable as android and people liked it right however as more and more people were already using android and those people getting into workforce the young ones they started to more you know uh, be uh, to uh, uh, be more focused towards android or um, or ios right and not much blackberry and uh, blackberry was not ready to adapt slowly slowly it had to change second example if we see in this is nokia so when nokia had their uh, you know phones if you remember that 1100 and you know double the double zero and all those models uh, if you see those phones those phones were very sturdy in those era but then as android was coming up you know it was becoming uh, less and less uh, in uh, let less and less uh, options were given in nokia right and thereby slowly the user base altered from nokia to, to other phones like motorola today it's red me and other other players people just uh, change to another brand and thereby it rejects the technology and what i had to actually stop uh, getting into the mobile next is switching cost and uh, loss aversion so if switching cost is not high people will automatically you know uh, reject your technology and can actually go to the, another one so these are some factors why pe uh, people reject technology and if you see uh, interestingly none of these factors we consider during our product design and development especially uh, if we consider variables or any other medical slash consumer products that we look at right so we don't look at these factors much and uh, thereby and we we focus on its features technical capabilities you know uh, possibilities etc and we forget about users in this entire picture and what happens when we forget that is when it gets into market slash when people start using it uh, the chances of it chances of the product slash technology to succeed can uh, reduce and that's a problem which we are trying to actually address because uh, if you we all as academicians have almost always spoken that or leave of academicians anyone in india has always spoken that there is no big technology coming from india no new product uh, coming out of india and so on and so forth and one of the reason why is because we are probably good in engineering but we are probably bad at showcasing the value right at the end of the day people pay, pay for your value that you are bringing in so these are some certain things uh, you know as researchers as product developers you know uh, as students we need to really look at and uh, you know start utilizing into our product development 
and before we i go to the next slide one of the main reason for uh, uh, for me to also choose this topic is i know most of the audience today here are faculty right and uh, if you see uh, today as we all know entrepreneurship is the need of our so that more and more jobs can be created and then there is another issue that we see is uh, you know uh, our all the news all the time it keep, keeps coming in that you know employability index and all those other things right and one of the reasons why this thing is uh, though we teach our students about problem solving though we teach our student about basics of engineering uh, how to use it how to apply it is something we don't uh, teach them some of them are smart enough they learn themselves and keep going ahead but unfortunately not all of them are like that right so as faculty if we to bring in these values and these understanding in their uh, you know cycle itself so whenever they start their project they will start looking at all those things when they start which may bring up better projects that they are working on and can lead to better research and probably a better invention so that's the whole cycle that we are trying to look at and how uh, our engineering student base which is one of the you know kind of largest base in the world can actually become from just uh, an engineer to a really good engineer so that's what we could uh, probably look at from this kind of a topic now just going forward uh, into hello excuse yeah. me there is a question from participant mm -hmm. janani ma'am you can unmute and you can e janani ma'am Okay, so that I think you can continue. Okay, fine. Sure. So, uh, sorry for the uh, small uh, delay over here. So now, just going a little more further about uh, this technology uh, uh, rejection. And uh, in the entire uh, paper, there was one particular thing that is user response to technological intensiveness. So, if your technology has intensive in nature or intrusive in nature or there is a lot of inputs needed from the user what would happen is as and when more and more intensiveness starts happening if you see there's an s curve that starts so if the intensiveness is somewhere in between acceptance is high but as the intensiveness keep because here basically people are interacting thereby they are accepting the technology but as the intensiveness increases it has an exponential chances of technology rejection so you can see how it's going in right so this is something now uh, if you look at an example for that is uh, i would say to an extent mobile phones mobile phones are slowly slowly coming into this range why because our screen times have increased uh, and because of the uh, the blue light uh, effects on our eye and all those things now people are getting into a scenario where they would like to have a balance between usage of mobile phone and you know uh, not using it so we need to be very careful in that aspect also sometimes over a period of time the technology which be uh, which is a really innovative one may lead into a zone where slowly it will start get rejected and there will be a one point when suddenly they will reject it all together and uh, if you look at and it could it, it cannot be only because of uh, intensiveness it could also be because there are better and simpler alternatives that have come in right because of that also it could be rejected now if i take a classic case of this uh, scenario i would uh, probably uh, look at an uh, uh, look at a case of again nokia over here when uh, nokia started it was really durable it was really good people liked its simplicity etc however interactions were lower but over a period of time as nokia started to build 6600 uh, and their advanced versions of model around that and the intensiveness of the nokia started increasing and better alternatives started coming slowly slowly it was getting into the rejection cycle right and if you see the way they started it was something like that and suddenly there was an exponential rejection and over one or one and a half years nokia actually ceased 
to exist nokia for a mobile phone brand ceased to exist right so all this thing is very much possible so you need to have uh, when when you are designing a technology slash product we need to really really be very cautious in all this aspect of it unfortunately sometimes we don't uh, look at it uh, in a better way right so and at the same time you have looking at you, uh, we can look at users uh, affinity to accept new technology right so if it is low intensive we think their acceptance will high and as this thing can go uh, over a period of time they get bored to it and they start losing its interest and example is uh, at least if i take my own case when i buy a new phone uh, i am very interested to use it for 5 or 10 days or 15 days at the most a month and slowly slowly after a month it's a it's a boring thing for me and you know it just becomes another piece of material for you, which is which has a use of telephone of course so this thing also has started to uh, have uh, this thing is also seen these days so we need to be very very cautious on how we are looking at thing and thereby what happens is every another year uh, after uh, i feel that i have got the value of the phone, i change the phone so if i am right over last 5 years so i have already changed about 5 to 6 phones and thanks to uh, you know the cloud uh, the first uh, the earlier we had an issue that if you are changing a phone getting your data back up and everything used to take a lot of time and thanks to cloud everything gets synchronized thereby you know it's become becoming more and more easy for us to change the devices so both the things happen uh, uh, often and we need to be aware of these things that's the whole point now uh, uh, now let me get into uh, some real examples which involves me and i'll take you through a entire story of why product experience was critical and how i lost about 8 years of my time in understanding this entire topic right so uh, it's more of a story time so please feel free to uh, you know kind of bug me ask me any questions that you may have and we can then take it from there right so uh, so now when it comes to the story uh, i was basically uh, 2011 i graduated my bachelor's uh, 2012 my mom suffered with neuropathy and she had an accelerated attack of neuropathy so what had happened her happened here is her right leg got numb and you know she was not able to move she was in pain she can't sense anything at the same time um, it was a painful thing to be seen right uh, i was uh, working at that time i was having a great job and things like that and uh, when this thing happened uh, i knew that i had to do something uh, as well i can't do anything and that was one of my motivation to join masters and my masters i did for electronics uh, so this was in 2012 so i was uh, i had luckily cleared it. through that i had got into the uh, system to study my masters and while studying my masters i started to design a system uh, and of neuromodulation where the whole idea was uh, similar to tens but uh, tens is transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulator people who know biomedical can understand that but, but the whole idea here is uh, can we have a sudar yeah sorry for interruption sudar i think yeah. you have some internet connectivity issue your audio is little bit struck striking oh uh, okay uh, yeah i don't know wifi network shows me full but yeah we'll try to see how can we improve it if there is any just let me know i'll just stop for a moment that time okay okay now you it is better you can continue yeah okay. yeah perfect sure. thanks yeah so i was telling uh, so basically uh, we, uh, whoever knows uh, biomedical they may know about tens which is transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulator where we give some electrical stimuli stimulus and the whole idea is to stimulate the nerves so my idea was quite similar on those lines where uh, I wanted to get some feedback from the uh, body to understand what is the impedance level of the body and how is the response of the body. And based on that, uh, I would give a stimulus to the patient or the uh, person here and would try, try to uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of stimulate the nerve over there. Thereby, by constantly stimulating and constantly sort of fooling your mind, 
we try to modulate uh, the signals and uh, hope we with the hope that with constant stimulus the nerve will get you know kind of triggered and retriggered and you may get out of this thing so that was the whole idea and if you see the research segment and have a, see a keyword search of neuromodulation you will come to know more about it so that was the whole thing that i was developing for my mom and i thought okay it should work uh, so i was doing it as part of uh, as uh, while being a master student at ceg so i made this uh, if you see this image uh, this is an image of 2015 uh, if i am right okay so basically if you see this small image small red dabba so this is what i had actually prototyped uh, while being a student for my mom i gave this to my mom and she started to use this device okay now funny part is uh, she used it for four weeks she had no uh, no response at all and fifth week onwards it responded right so her right toe actually started to move she could actually start you know feeling the pulses again and slowly slowly it was help, helping her now what happened is she continuously used this product for a while when i say for a while at least for about 9 to 15 months she used it and while using it like regularly um, almost regularly like, like you know probably daily uh, once a day she was using it uh, she reached to a, st a stage where she was 80% all right where she started to walk she could have this sensation etc right so it's a, it was a great success story for me at that time as fiesta innovations and you could see this small dabba so from this red box it became to this white box so this is 2014 actually uh so but again what i what i observed was after when once again there's a bad network which is shown here can you guys hear me yes sir so, yeah perfect so uh, basically uh, she uh, she used this device for about 15 months she got about 80% heal after that she stopped using it okay and uh, you know i didn't know why she stopped using it i thought okay she she is feeling great and that's why she stopped however she was using it intermittently whenever like her condition she thought is going bad or if the pain started increasing she started to use it i was wondering what why and what because uh, the device is working well it is doing the job that it should do all those things were happening right so i was not sure what was happening so uh, in year 2015 um, i actually had the issue of uh, you know swollen elbow and it was painful for me a lot of time and uh, i didn't know what's exactly happening so i thought okay let me use my device and see what's happening so i started to use my own device to understand what's happening to me it obviously helped me with the problem but i also realized the other issue that i had given that i was mobile and my mom after getting 80% heal she was also having a mobility this device now actually uh, started to hinder my mobility that means if i have to use this device for that 20 30 minutes i have to just sit there is no option with me right uh so basically though it is a portable device very small handy to cover but there is a wire coming up in it and there are two electrodes going and sitting on the hands right so this uh, start uh, this basically stopped the mobility and uh, thereby when i am like uh, i am in pain but not in a scenario where it's too much i may not use that technology right so this is something which uh, we figured out uh, that okay it had to be a little more uh, wearable and not this kind of a variable and this technology could work i spent a lot of energy uh, of course the technology was validated in the student and everything but still it was not rational and we had to stop this company uh, that's a story it was a certain time but then this is the version one Okay. the functionality worked really well there was no problem with that however uh, the resist point was stop it uh, hindered my mobility by the usability was a problem in this case okay this is the first case that i was 
so i to tell and then, as i told you my as the story continues uh, okay again there is some college this thing uh, okay again as the story uh, continues uh, i finished my masters in 2014 i was uh, trying to get this working got some grants here and there got some funds here and there but it didn't move it had to stop and that's when i thought okay i should try and uh, do a masters in uh, innovation space and try to understand the mistakes that i must have made so i realized that i have not made big mistakes as such it's just very small small mistakes that i have made and uh, technology was successful right so i thought okay let me try to take another case and see how things actually happen and that's where version 2.0 comes in picture so this was version okay so now in this version 2.0 i did i did one smart thing i did not prototype because prototyping a lot of Involved, and then you do a lot of validation around it, right? So what I did is, while doing my uh, PhD, I finished my comprehensive exam. Uh, until the comprehensive exam, I was actually trying to understand the entire ecosystem, all the processes, everything, and I was trying to figure out why my first thing was going wrong, right? Uh, thankfully, uh, I got that I got my admission in IIC, and that could allow me to do it. So after doing it, what I did is uh, in 2019. uh so i was i started working on it and all those things in 2019 again i started to take back this project and uh, we started to design a concept uh, on variable which i thought was my first mistake so if you see now that one big bar which is coming everything, everything would have gone to this particular uh, uh, uh kind of strap and guys which stimulus can Uh, plug into the strap directly thereby there is now you can be mobile right so that's also what uh, we thought and then we thought when people wear it we can get some sensation data we can try and look at uh, you know how to quantify pain and things like that all those thing we thought so this is our second concept which we designed but this time as i told i was smarter i did not prototype rather what i did it this is also so basically this kind of sketch or this kind of concept design is also called as prototype okay uh, functional prototype is not only the pro method of prototyping so before i started to do a functional prototype i thought okay let me make a conceptual prototype which is in form of an image now this image i took to people i started speaking doctors like the idea because doctors here are not users they are enablers they like the way it would have worked uh you know nimans uh, we start, we started speaking to some doctors in nimans and things like that people liked the way we were going people had an idea that okay it could work possibly uh and it it could have, it could have been a better system is what the doctors felt however we kept on speaking to uh, patients we uh, we looked at grants and all those things everywhere we were getting rejection okay and one of the biggest uh, feedback that we got of why this particular concept was being rejected is here whenever there is a pain for such a user they have to pick it up wear it you know and then it would work but the whole idea of getting the feedback data which could actually help in the modulations that are required for the platform for that they would have to wear it for a longer duration uh, so instead of 20 minutes now they would have to at least wear it for one one and a half hours which becomes inconvenient and at the same time uh, you know it's an extra device that they wear it okay uh, it's not like kind of something they are used to it so thereby for this concept to be successful uh the, uh they there are there is a user behavior that we are looking at so basically where the user wears it daily gets it uh, you know gets the pain off and keep keeps giving us the data and then uh, you know they have to do it daily the same thing right which may or may not be feasible and thereby this concept was getting rejected in that type piece so we started to do this part and uh, that's how the we understood that okay uh if we look at changing a user behavior probably the concept which could solve so much of problem will not be accepted see over in all this thing one thing was clear the concept was right the technology was perfect uh technology was working but the problem is the user may not use it uh you know as intended and thereby the whole purpose of the technology or the whole value that you are creating in the ecosystem 
will get nullified, right? So that's what happens in this case. So we just uh, spoke and we got this feedback and this entire process just to get the feedback and understand the problem took us about about roughly an year, right? So May 29, uh, sorry, Feb 2019 I started and by Jan Feb it was clear that this concept is not going to work. And that's when the third concept came in. So this is the current concept that we are working on. See, tech is same. Of course, there are a lot of add-ons, feature add-ons and everything, no doubt. And uh, a lot of new technology coming into picture. The same uh, tech as is changing the model. There are a lot of other changes also that has, uh, that is coming up in this case. So this third thing, we started to work in May 2020 during the lockdown. And thereby there is a lot of delay also because of that. So now we went on to study further our understanding. What is the thing that's going wrong and why are we not able to make it work? Why the users are rejecting an idea of bearing a you know, new device as such? And that's when, when we started to talk, started to understand the ecosystem better everything became clear. It was thought that it should be uh, embedded in such a way that the technology is part of something it's already used or regularly used, right? And, uh, and that's when everything started to form up a picture that uh, everyone who has uh, issue with nerve degeneration wears a footwear automatically. Others may, may or may not wear a footwear at home and other places. However, people who have neurodegeneration will wear a footwear, right? And they have this pain. So it all became clear that if we embed the technology within the footwear, all of it, probably we'll get the data that we want for the longer duration. And in fact, more long than uh, one and a half hours that we were thinking, it could act as an intervention tool and everything, right? So like that, it started to form, uh, you know, clear out the puzzle. And finally, uh, when we made this kind of a conceptual design and we started to talk to people again, trying to show them that yeah, this is what we are doing, this is what the plan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People now started to tell, yes, this probably we'll be using regularly and it could be very helpful. In fact, they gave us more and more suggestions on how to improve and all those things. We started to talk to the government agencies about this concept, showed them how it looks like, we started to get uh, started to get grants around it. So, so when uh, you know that experience part gets covered, all of these things which were a hindrance in the past started to just vanish, right? Everything started to fall in place. And today, if you see, we are uh, uh, we are we have started a prototype. We are almost about to finish up uh, uh, the first uh, version of the design, uh, first version of, version of the development. We've got a couple of grants already uh, and uh, we are planning for a crowdfunding campaign some, somewhere in May 2021 and the footwear would actually now get realized by April 2022 that is in market. Uh, so we could actually now do a lot of things fast and a lot of people started joined the entire wagon. So the and of course this has a lot of other things uh, like uh, uh, of course you have deep learning coming in picture because we are doing a lot of prevention and neurodegeneration, uh, you have digital twins coming. So you can always look at this uh, keyword like, like digital twins to understand what it is. It is basically glorified form of physiological modeling that we do and uh, other areas. So, so these are how uh, things can start falling in place if we start trying to understand end to end the requirement of the ecosystem and slowly, slowly, slowly everything can work out well for you. So that's where uh, uh, though we take this as uh, the last thing and technology becomes first for us. If we don't see how the uh, technology is going to be disseminated, uh, you know, it's going to be a big problem for all of us. So that's how uh, version three of the footwear is coming up. Now, uh, let me go to go back to our topic. Uh, since I gave you one three level case study. Now we can look at there are certain aspects uh, and studies that are happening, which tells that consumers resistance to innovation, especially considering smart clothing because it's wearable. I'm getting into this topic, right? So based on uh, a 2020 paper, uh, 2020 paper, uh, there was a study that they did where they did uh, interviews of 40 or 40 odd people and uh, there was a whole diverse group around it and they wanted to understand whether people will adopt smart clothing, right? 
and as per all of our uh, discussions ideas and even this entire workshop that we had uh, we all we are telling that wearables are the future smart clothing is believed to uh, have an enormous growth potential right but however when it when we go to the consumers many of them have stated that they would not buy smart clothing unless a trustable brand produces it with appropriate functions and lower prices so that's what is one of the comments that have come out so anyone that we are going we need to really look into either creating a trusted brand or collaborating with a trusted brand to actually take your uh, uh, idea to market so both of them both both the way works first way is a little pain because you will have to do all the hard work whereas in the second way uh, only thing that good happens would be uh, you know there's already a brand established brand and they will help you to cover most of your ground and thirdly if we say, uh, if they look at some people said that they refused to purchase smart clothing due to aesthetic dissatisfaction despite the improved quality and performance so you can see how aesthetic is becoming very very important in this kind of a scenario so now given that i spoke about uh, smart clothing and aesthetic i want to now uh, talk about uh, one more case with you guys uh and this case is also very uh, interesting one if you look at it uh and again uh, it's not exactly variable but a little in medical domain and this is the case of smart skin okay so there was an era about 5 6 or 10 years back when everyone were obsessed with uh, smart skins when i say obsessed they all were talking about using ultrasound sensor haptics and blah blah to make a cane which is really smart and which can you know help blind people walk and navigate through the roads etc so that was the case and there are many brands that came up with different different types of smart canes uh, different different colors different different materials etc 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 right however there was one very successful one uh, which is a case study uh, out of iit delhi uh, and uh, a uh, phoenix medical systems chennai right so they both jointly made a smart cane uh, which was supported by welcome trust so uh, i was having an interaction with the designer of uh, that cane you know the uh, this thing so what was you know this uh, funny part or the important part so we all know blind people cannot see isn't it so uh, we never think aesthetics is very critical for blind people right because they can't see however when they were looking uh, when they went on to understand uh, the customer or understand the user the surprising thing that came out is blind people also felt important to look good right so for them one of the critical point is even they even though they can't see their point was they want to look good using that smart cane it should not look something kind of bulky and things like that and all those things right so that became uh, one of the major important requirement and now the team had a bigger task of putting in that technology in such a sleek way such that everything can happen at the same time the blind looks good so aesthetics become very critical and if as a technology uh, technologist or you know inventor we forget that what would happen is we may end up making bulky devices which will be again rejected so thereby again product experience coming into major uh, uh, a factor especially considering the dissemination of the product or marketing the product right so uh, this is also one of the interesting thing that's been studied uh, extensively on uh, aesthetics uh, and other areas right so uh, basically this is a, a kind of a, a thing that i have found out uh, from internet of course tradhunter.com so they were looking at how do we look at these kind of various opportunity which are around and as per the current trend these are the six important factors that uh, people need to really look at when they are developing the product uh, right from acceleration to reduction of material to convergence of technology divergence of applicability you know redirection of things where old uh, uh, ideas are being brought in together again and then the whole uh, you know circularity and or circular economy that we talk about it and under that if you see there are multiple aspect right from uh, you know user centric 
uh, AI to catalyzation, when it comes to acceleration, when it comes to reduction, it's talk, talking about entrepreneurship, simplicity, curation. When we talk about uh, convergence, they're talking about multi-sensation, hybridization, co-creation. So that's how uh, things can be worked out. When it comes to divergence, we're talking about personalized devices, many to many, uh, you know, where you're talking about a ma marketplace kind of a model, authentic in nature. If you look at the redirection, we are talking about uh, right from certification experience to, you know, uh, tribalism, that is community building activity. Finally, if you look at the cyclis, uh, cyclis, uh, cyclicality, that is bringing the old uh, design back, they're looking at uh, something like nostalgia, youthfulness, etc. So these are the pattern of opportunity that are seen and it can be used in multiple ways. So having this trend, understanding of this trend would be very important when we are looking at uh, designing for product experience. One thing. And as I told you, uh, all this comes under human factors engineering. And uh, that's one of the key studies where people are not, not many people are there. And looking at this as a holistic in nature helps a lot for your technology to be successful, right? So, uh, sorry for that. Okay, so now uh, we've finished the first part of product experience where I've told you the problems, I've told how things happen, uh, etc. And uh, just, just to add on to uh, that particular point, uh, so basically, uh, I'm not sure how many of you understand uh, systems engineering and within systems engineering, uh, there is an entire, there are two segments. One is requirements engineering and within the requirements engineering, you will have uh, human factors as one of the critical aspect. So if you look at requirements and, uh, and this all is before you actually develop a product or you before you develop the concept. So if you specifically look at into requirements engineering and uh, human factors engineering or some people also can call it as usability engineering, right? These are the things that, uh, you know, uh, you need to really bring in before you start your conceptual design so that when you design your concept, you can trace back whether you are able to satisfy these requirements, human factors, usability. And so ergonomics comes again under usability slash human factors, right? You need to look at all of this thing if it works and only when that works, that concept becomes successful uh, or a concept becomes uh, holistic in nature and then you start the whole development cycle. And why uh, this is important is as in a more uh, students are now getting into entrepreneurship, since they don't understand these basics uh, while they are in college or while they are working as project in college or they're not, they're not heard about it. What happens is many of these many many times these students actually tend to make a product which is failing because they have not considered this properly. People may say that it's common sense, but again, common sense is not common among all, right? So thereby you need to really uh, you know understand this as a process, and if these kind of topics are brought in into our curriculum, and students are also taught and even in our researchers, which are application based researchers, not the uh, basic sciences, but application research. If we, in an application research, we are able to bring this in right in the start of our research, what would have we right now? We of course have literature survey that we do. But apart from that, if we do all these things, what would happen is our outcome can be easily translated. And uh, the patent that you must have generated while doing the research will have more uh, usability and more utility, right? Otherwise, right now what happens is, uh, since researchers work, uh, you know, and into their research, get the technology in place, and then uh, luckily, let's say, you have technology transfer team, which say transfers the technology to the industry. And then from industry, if they again start working on from this and getting it in place, there's a lot of time that is wasted, right? So that uh, specific time is the resources that the industry has to put, plus the patent that you started is only valid for 20 years. After that, it is going to be open in the place. Anyone can use it, right? So that 20 years, that also because of it to commercially success starts reducing exponentially. So that's the reason why uh, as 
as academics and faculties, if we understand these aspects uh, part, as part of engineering, it becomes much more easy. Uh, of course, there are. If you look at industry, we have the entire segment called as product designers slash industrial designers who may do all these things. But uh, for a startup, it is not always feasible to take their help, right? And thereby, it's good to have good if they know some things already about around this. So now, uh, what we'll do is, uh, for, uh, before I get into design thinking, which could be a solution for this problem, uh, I can take some questions for next five to ten minutes, and then we can get into design thinking. Yeah, any questions? Uh, you can put it in chat, and I can, uh, you know, uh, ask from there also. This. That's all but totally fine. If you are having any doubt, you can also raise your hands so that we will allow you to unmute your mics. Any questions? <clears throat> yes, so that way there is one. Someone has raised the hand, yeah. Yeah, Arunagiri, sir, you can unmute. Uh, good morning, sir. This is an informative session, okay? And uh, I need some help regarding a material which we can follow, which we will not miss during uh, designing or doing a research for application research, sir. Uh, so you mean that uh, some kind of a framework which you could follow, right? Or some yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sir. Yeah. So, uh, so th th there are two things here. Right now, design thinking, which I'm going to talk, will help you do that. Secondly, okay. as part of my PhD, I have come up with uh, something that I call as MD3, that is Medical Device Design Development and Dissemination Framework, where uh, actually as a toolkit and as a game, I have covered all these points step by step. Uh, that should be uh, published in another three months. So uh, I'm, I'll be happy to share that as well uh, when it comes. Okay, sir. Uh, anything regarding the other field of application other than medical uh, regarding? No, no, no. Uh, so all these things are generic actually. Uh, okay. But you know that PhD, we can't even have it generic, right? So we have to have a specific application. So as a case study application, it was medical in case, but it can be used uh, across the field. Okay, thank you. And uh, design thinking, which I'm going to talk now, uh, is a generic one as well. Don't worry about it. Okay, so that you can continue. Okay, uh, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, just uh, one uh, caution or one thing, please. Uh, though I have spoken for about one hour, it's never enough to disseminate the whole knowledge. So, uh, please do go back and search about human factors, usability engineering, user product experience, user experience. So, these are your keywords uh, which will add on to. Uh, your engineering knowledge and that can make it as a whole. Right? So I'll again share my screen. Yeah. So now, uh, as I told, like uh, I told you the problems and everything now. Uh, and as uh, already uh, Sir asked about that question, like you no know, guide or a, you know kind of a tool which can help you to go through all these things. So one, there are many tools, uh, you know, in design thinking that has been come up. So one is uh, Stanford D School model. Another is uh, UK Design Council's Double Diamond. As I told you, as part of my PhD, I have come up with a model as well. So there are multiple models that have come up on, uh, on uh, benefits and disadvantages, right? So one of the models that right now I'm going to take is called as Stanford D design thinking process. Again, I cannot go in So what I'll do is I'll talk about this is a very easy process. Uh, and then I'll go through another case study with you. I'll show you the content in that. It's a it's a from internet, so not should not be an issue. You can always go back and see how they have done it. And this could possibly help you, uh, uh, you know, look at it as part of this D school design thinking model. It is also called as Edipt model. So when I say Edipt, uh, just one second, please. 
Yeah, so when I call it as adrift, yeah. Huh. So Stanford's design school uh, uh, process it's called as adrift because it's uh, it's a abbreviation for empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. So that is what is edit model uh, we talk about. So when we look at uh, edit, so what uh, they do uh, in this model is first they will empathize with the people. So you know instead of just doing your literature review, they will also interview people, affected people. They will shadow. When I say shadow, that means they will follow them, try to understand their day-to-day -day life, what are the problems that they are following. And with these issues, what all things can happen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they shadow the person. They try to understand more. But in all this process, one thing is clear that they will not judge them. The person can be bad, good, or whatever it is. They don't judge the person. So you just need to do that. You need to empathize with that person, understand it in and out, what are the problems. And then once you do that, you do it, you start writing the requirements or start uh, writing the problems and then that problems comes into us uh, neutral, so, uh, neutral statements like uh, we may tell not able to walk, right? So we start talking about neutral statement that is uh, immobility or etc. So we start to write that. Then we start defining. So now we empathize with the person, we empathize with the problem. Now we start to define the problem. That is, we'll define the person. Uh, uh, that is, how is that typical user? What is his day-to-day -day life, his or her day-to-day -day life? What are the objectives and roles that they have to play? What are the decisions that they need to take? What are the challenges? What are the pain points? You start defining the entire person. You start defining your product requirements, right? So define is basically you will start writing what are the product requirements based on all these things that you studied now, right? Again, as I told you, this is a very abstract model uh, of design thinking. That's why very easy. Uh, however, uh, the one that I'm making is very uh, elaborate and can take you step by step, right? Now from this pain points, you start ideating on concept. So you start trying to look at concept which can actually satisfy all these requirements that you have come up in defined stage, right? So then you will be like sharing your ideas, trying to evaluate your ideas, trying to evaluate your concept. And let's say you, let's say after evaluation, you will think that, okay, this particular concept will work well. So now this particular concept you will be quickly prototyping. And when I say prototyping, I'm not meaning that you put your circuit sugar or anything. No, I'm talking about make it a mock-up, kind of a sketch, a storyboard, very simple, which is very fast to make so that you can iterate quickly, right? That is prototyping in this case. You iterate it and then you start testing it. So when you say testing, so as I told you, I made that mock-up uh, or a, a kind of a sketch about how the product would look like. And I started to go and ask people whether they understand, whether it will make sense, whether the solution is right. And then you can keep iterating this as many times as possible till you get the right one. And then you start investing more and more money in hardware prototyping. So this is one very simple, easy process which we can follow, which is fast and at the same time uh, quick for it. Uh, so this is good for research for sure, good for uh you know uh, basic uh, college projects and things like that so so this is kind of widely used worldwide and of course as i told you stanford was the one which made this particular uh, design thinking model now based on this design thinking model uh, as i told you you have you have to have empathize define idea prototype and test what we will do is we look at a case study around it so this is not something which i worked but i'm going to show you a case study which was published in medium.com about how this person has used this particular uh, framework, design thinking framework, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you all see my screen now? Yeah, can you see my screen, uh, Sam? Yes, sir. Uh, is it uh, is it Safari or is? Yeah, 
BYBR. Ah, perfect. That's what you want to do. Uh, it's power. No, it's not the PowerPoint, right? It is the website. Yes, sir. It's, it's the website. website right? Okay. So now uh, this is a medium.com website where people can publish their case studies or you know their articles. So this is one particular product uh, where they are making uh, you know some kind of hoodie which could relieve stress. So that's the problem that they looked at. So basically uh, it it's from ISDI Mumbai where the professor gave them a task and the task was to choose three topics that they cared and uh, they had to make one page material etc so the, these students started to look at and one topic that they looked at is mental health right so that's what is the topic that they uh, selected now for that particular topic they use this uh, edit framework which i showed you just now so now what they did is for this particular stage uh, as part of empathize they did first is something called a secondary research so they went into you know website, try to understand major cause of uh, stress. Uh, they looked at World Health Organization estimates. They looked at various symptoms. Uh, they also tried to understand various reports. So based on all this report, they came up with some uh, initial hypothesis, and then they also did a mind map where they tried to map out all the major causes of stress and you know uh, the mental health scenarios that are there. And if you see, this is how the mind map looks like. It's a it's a huge thing where you just connect so many thoughts that you may have, and the mental health uh, crisis. So this is how the their mind map looked like. So if you see, there are so many points that they came right from uh, marriage to diseases to uh, whatever I can read. I'm reading out of this, but yeah, OCD goes on. So they just kept on doing it, and then they came up with something called as affinity map. So affinity map is to gain some clarity, clarity and define the problem. They look took took out similar topics from the mind map and clustered them into themes. So it's also called as thematic analysis or affinity map. So out of all these things, they came up with these themes, right? One is love and relationship. Second is education. Third is economy. Fourth is media. Fifth is health. Sixth is violence. Seventh is self-esteem. Eighth is OCD, right? So they came up with these research. Then they did the primary research. So what they did is they tried to go and talk to people, understand the stress, and everything. And after all, right? So now in workplace stress, they tried to do the interviews and the sites. Uh, now in the defined stage, what they did is they did the interviews inside to understand build up around the user technology, right? So they tried to find a persona. In this case, they found that uh, two distinct personas are formed. One focused on people that work in corporate industries, whereas the other one focused on people working in creative industries. So creative is kind of design, graphics, uh, uh, all those things. Corporate is uh, our normal jobs that we do. And they created an empathy map around it. So, uh, so we a small tool called empathy map where you will do think, say, feel, do, and they just write it, right? So as a field, they told exhausted, angry, irritated, goes on. As do, that is because of working at work. It's just First time following up, distracted by social media, etc. And similarly, think and say, right? Then uh, try to find more and try to kind of define their requirements. They define the requirements and then they started ideating. So uh, again, this is not step by step everything, but just the brief of it, just to give you an idea. So in ideating, they were looking at you know. Uh, uh, ideas can come in so when it when you come in ideation and brainstorm session one thing you should remember that no idea is a stupid idea every idea is a good idea you need to write it down workability non-workability you should not be thinking during the ideation session that comes in your analysis session right so these guys came up with ideas of a sensor hoodie a nap pod a, a stress release zone a meant to health app a rant mirror etc etc right 
so they came up with these kind of targeting things and then uh, out of these what they did is they started to prototype right and they uh, they told that okay since our target area was workplace and the const const constant emerging theme in most interviews was the lack of rest time and a lot of stress they decided decided to revolve most if not all our ideas around the products that would relieve stress and then they started to uh, prototype all this concept so when i say prototype they were like sketching it like say for or making a clay model of it so like for example this is how the nap pod would look like then they were looking at a rant mirror so where you know you are actually ranting out your stress when your ba boss asks for proof you are in hospital etc etc uh, we all must have understood this already so and then they were looking at an app so they just uh, prototype a workflow of how the app would work right and then they looked at sensor hoodie like various sensors in a hoodie and you know how this thing and at the end finally after doing prototyping and uh, they must have done some analysis around the prototype and finally uh, they decided that they are making a massaging hoodie right so they again did a test uh, asked a couple of working individuals uh, which one of these that is the uh, top 5 ideas that they had were they most likely to use at their workplace making sure that project wasn't just a hypothetical project but was an executable business and 95% of the people rated the massaging hoodie to as positive so we so they began prototyping again except this time they made it as functional so they started to actually make a functional hoodie which can also massage so you see there are vibrators that are kept and they found out some stress relieving point where you can massage and they started to prototype that and now with all these things you know they uh, did the entire embedding of the electronics part of it and finally uh, they prototype the whole hoodie with massages around it right and then uh, of course uh, that's how they made the whole product where they have this uh, entire hoodie and things around it and then uh, now to see if this particular product has a good business opportunity uh, they started to look at uh, various uh, it's called as value value proposition proposition canvas so it's a it's a tool available for businesses actually where they can see the gain pain and the jobs so if you see first you have to do the pain so using it in hot atmosphere removing the massager out before washing the hoodie and replacing the battery and limited battery life for the pain of the product a uh, customer job was uh, reduce stress uh, during times of pressure relax and clearing the mind increasing productivity get less irritated take a break to refresh making migraines and headaches more tol uh, tolerable and by doing this the gain was comfort and warmth convenient to carry can be used anywhere without being conscious of using a head massage device in public uh, reduce the threshold of headaches versatility in design and that would help in the workflow and then they told that these are the gain creators or the features that can create the gains these are the features which can help the product uh, for customer doing the customer job and this is how the pain would be relieved right so that's how they made a value proposition canvas and trying to understand how it would work and uh, finally again this was a academic project uh, and they did a decent job in that and uh, made this entire uh, you know kind of a wearable hoodie which could probably relieve your stress right so this is one uh, good case study that i found uh, while preparing for this talk uh, so yeah now uh, as part of design thinking i'm done uh, we can open for questions if there are no questions i can take one or two more examples uh, any questions uh yeah i can see one person raising hands Uh, Savinathan, can you unmute Omesh M V sir? Hello. Just uh, a second, sir. Uh, just a second, sir. Sure. And is there any questions around uh, in the chat? Because I cannot read them. 
there are some blank messages that I can see. Siddharth, wait. Yeah. That's a question. Umesh sir, now you can unmute. Uh, hello sir. Yeah. Um, Siddharth, uh, what you are talking about edit, uh, edit, right? When you mm -hmm. say empathize and uh, define, then it is going into ideate. So is it empathize when you are doing it? It is basically, I can say that it is a, uh, so like a survey and when it comes to define is it a market research what market requirement specifications mrs in the no. industrial parlance no 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 here we are not talking right now about business here we are not talking about surveys or you know trying to see if there is a problem here in empathize we are trying to understand the problem what is the problem we are trying to understand right what are the uh, what uh, what is the day to day job of your user we are trying to understand we are trying to see how all the product can benefit them we are trying to see here right okay. so this yeah. is not a survey this is you going and talking to people when i say talking i am talking about taking interviews with them i am talking about uh, shadowing them that is just following and observing what are their work that they do and noting yeah. down the uh, observations, right? Yeah, that's a, uh, basically I'm collecting the information regarding the the new concept or new product, right? Whatever I'm going to do it. No, I am. We are taking information about the problem, not the product. No, that's what the problem. I want to convert it into a product. Then I will look into the problem as a see as my uh, this one. I look the problem as a product for me. No. See, once the problem is there, I can attack. I can get a solution. Then it becomes a product, right? No, Mr. Umesh, that's the whole point that I'm trying to make it. When we are doing this empathize, the solution should not be in your mind also. And we should not even think of product at that time. It's like just a human to human understanding of what's going on. That's it. Your, the whole, the biggest problem in this is uh, we are trained to look at solutions and uh, if our brain is trained to that. As soon as we see something, first thing that comes in our mind is solution, right? So the whole exercise of empathy is just forget about everything and just see what is the problem. Just understand, nothing else. No solution, no product in picture, nothing. It's just like uh, pure uh, talking about people. That's all. Okay. And what this does is uh, once you uh, make your observation and come back uh, in your drawing board, you may convert these two requirements, product requirements. Yeah. Right. Uh, Again, uh, there is a difference between market requirement and a product requirement. So market requirement is you're just looking at, you know, what is the market place and how it is, what is the competition and things like that. But in product, no, it's not necessary. Not necessary. The market, this requirement is what the uh, the see pro problems, whatever I identified with the people. When I discuss with the people, I get the uh, what are the pain points and all those things. That that is what when you say that uh, see if uh, somebody wants to uh, this one see now he has got the idea. What are the things he got? What are the problems the people are facing or what are the pain points? Then he will note it down. That is. If I want to do it, I want to get this pain to be relieved or these pain points to be addressed, then I need these, these, these things. So that is where we call it as MRS. It is not necessarily that the marketing, uh, this one it is. So that's See, what the, I was, as I told you earlier, uh, that's where uh, I follow the terms in requirements engineering. Yeah. So as I told, uh, as part of yeah, that's what, that's what only thing is what I'm saying is it is when you theoretically when you're talking when it comes to the practical this one aspect as the industry this one see this is uh, equivalent to what I'm saying it I'm not denying what you're saying it. I so agree, my, sir. So, yeah, because uh, requirement specification is starts from the that then what you are saying product define when it comes to the define uh, this one. So this mm -hmm. is basically a product requirements right that is what product requirement specification define PRS is, we are right. Define is product requirement totally right. Yeah, but empathy, I am just telling is uh, we think it is a little different aspect of it. And uh, secondly, uh, so that's what Omesh said, as part of my own startup. Uh, yeah. So I, I actually I come from both academic and industry background, right? So yeah. 
when it comes to the startup, the biggest issue that we all see is a uh, resource constraint, right? Uh, basically, uh, when I had started, I didn't even have a single penny with the company in it picture, right? So uh, in those kind of a scenario, how do we use these kind of tools is what is the most critical aspect. And uh, what, what happens in the empathy stage is when we keep talking about it to so many people, and when we show them the test, what will happen is uh, we will start cre creating collaborations which will enable us in developing the products. So thereby this kind of methods help you more. But again, if you have some resources already, that is always a faster way to do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the best example why I gave this one was uh, uh, you heard about Sumo, right? Tata Sumo. Yeah. That is Sumit. Actually, that is uh, Sumit Gaukar. It is actually his name they gave uh, that this one Madgaukar or something. It is his. Actually, he was a Tata direct uh, general manager or higher position. Right. right. He right. went. What he did is he used to go to the uh, what is that? All Dabas. Mm -hmm. he used to go there at lunch hour. He used to go and he used to sit with there and those truck drivers when he comes, he is converse with them. He doesn't say that I am so and so, all those things. Just as a casual, this one he used to talk to them, talk about trucks and all those things. Then they used to give the pain points what they are facing. Exactly. Yeah. That is how so he came I... out. Because the people in there, uh, this one, they say that he's a higher position where he's going. He's going for a five star hotel food and all those things. They were suspecting him about that. And Correct. somebody followed him. When they followed him, they saw that he's going to Dabas and he's sitting with the drivers and talking. Then they realized what he's doing it. Then he came Correct. out, he came back and he gave uh, this one. This is the problems the, the uh, drivers are facing. So our truck should have these uh, facilities. This is what changes we need to do it. Correct. So because of that, in his name, that Sumo, they gave uh, that whatever the Jeep they converted, right? That is in his name they gave that. It is not the sumo. Usually we feel that it's a Japanese name. It is not a Japanese name. It is in his name they put that. It is so, first two letters of his name and the last two letters of his uh, uh, what is that uh, sorry, address? Sorry. Uh, this one, uh, what the family name? That is so, what it is actually sumo is. Right. So, so that's how I'm so, linking with that the empathize there. Exactly, sir. So that, that's what I'm trying to tell you. So though we have seen this one of examples everywhere, the point yeah. is when we get into our own development, we forget to do this, right? Yeah. Somehow right. Uh, in our busy life or in our comfort zone that we are in our labs or in our offices, we don't do it. And uh, and that's uh, one of the major reason why a lot of products are failing today because we are not solving the pain points. And uh, uh, that's where the product experience aspect came into the whole picture, right? So it is, as I told you, it's nothing new. It is. It was always there. Some people knew it. Only thing is yeah. we are trying to formalize it so that all know it and we have better chances of success. That's the whole idea of it. Yeah. You're Thank you. About that, yeah. Perfect, yeah. Uh, any other question or any other comments? Uh, thank you, sir, for sharing your experience in this. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we have any other question? Participants, if you are having any questions, you can raise your hands so that I will, we will allow you to unmute your mic and you can discuss with the speaker. No, so that you can continue. Got it. So what I'll do is I'll take one uh, last example and uh, probably end the session for the day. So uh, if we look at uh, one more example that I had, it was called as uh, OrCam I2. Okay. So OrCam I2 is basically a uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll do a Google search as I talk so that it becomes easy for you all. Yeah, so uh, I'm just again doing a Google search and I'm typing OrCam I2. Okay, so this is also a very uh, interesting, uh, you know, kind of case study. Uh, so basically, if you look at OrCam I2 and images, it's a small device uh, here. So if you 
see this particular part of it. Uh, there is an attachment to a specs, right? So the whole idea of this particular device was uh, to feed a, a people who are either partially or completely blind. So because you all know that blindness also has a degree of uh, this thing variation. So this particular uh, device was that. Okay. So now what they did is uh, basically they embedded a camera in it so that whatever the person reads or something, it gets converted to a sound and there's a small microphone, you know, and uh, using a kind of a bone conduction uh, kind of a thing, if you see here in the image, uh, this particular uh, mi uh, microphone used to give the data to them, right? Or uh, li uh, basically they can listen to what you're talking about. So you can look at the bone conduction. You can see this image where there's a small speaker and that they can hear on it. So this is what they made and uh, here if you see the whole idea was to help such people uh, and uh, this has been a good product experience altogether because they did not only handle that aspect of it, they also looked at aesthetics and there was also certain more features that they tried. So let's open the uh, website itself for you. So if you see this Orca Mai 2, uh, they tried to, uh, okay. There's some issue with this. Okay, I'm visiting the website. Unfortunately, it's blocked by ISD. Sorry for that. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just try to open something else. It's a blocked set. Uh, okay, so let's go open Amazon because Amazon will for surely work. And if you see, this is what uh, they did as an Orcam i2 and uh, these were its feature. So basically uh, it's a lightweight smart camera that attaches to any glasses. So they, they saw to it that people are not stuck with just one kind of frame. They, you can use any kind of frame and just, just use this as an attachment uh, overall, right? And uh, the features, if you look at it over here, right? One is it's a very user in interactive, so they they use haptics to the touch, and they also use the voice command option over here, right? And anything they could read, right, from uh, whatever is in your uh, kind of bread cover to anything, right? So it could read text, it could recognize face. So let's say for example, I come in between, the it will, the camera will recognize me and tell that okay, Siddharth is here. You can identify product, okay? It can work everywhere basically and does not require internet connection. Uh, it was voice command, so you don't need to even touch. You can just give a voice command and uh, the camera would do the things. Uh, of course, uh, it had Bluetooth because it was pairing with your headphone or speaker also. And uh, yeah, so that became so easy that so many people could use. However, uh, the drawback is uh, unfortunately given that uh, it, it's a solution of West, US and others. If you see the product cost of a new is somewhere around $2,000. About 1 lakh 35, 40,000 rupees. So affordability was a big problem and thereby the usage became less. And as I had earlier told about technology rejection, that, that became a reason. But however, <laughs> we should understand over here not every device that you make and just because it is expensive, it's a technology rejection, right? And uh, I wanted to emphasize this point as my last point, basically. Uh, so basically every product is made for a target audience, right? And the problem happens of rejection is when you generalize it, right? So you tell that, okay, this is my solution and this solution can be used anyone with this problem. That's not how things work, right? Because uh, when you look at affordability as one of the parameter, what is affordable to me may not be affordable to you and vice versa. What is affordable to you may not be affordable to me, right? And then there will be other requirements as you get into the you know, uh, economic strata of it, right? So someone with uh, kind of good income and all those things may have some other requirements. That is someone with you know lower uh, income but similar problems may have some other requirements. So never try to generalize your product for that. Just try to target, and only when you target like this is the audience, this is the product. That's when it will become successful. And now, for example, if I uh, take one more case, uh, 
uh, let's take a scenario of an iPhone, right? Now iPhone, uh, we all know that hardware is actually having a lower specification than most of your Android phones. However, the product experience of iPhone is great because the software which is designed is so closely connected and so close loop that it is very intuitive, very interactive and there are literally no lag because I'm using iPhone now. I can tell you that and I have used Android. So that's why I can tell you that in a better way. However, uh, if iPhone had, iPhone with a great product experience I would have made a device at 10,000 rupees, it may not have been that distinct because the efforts required may not have worked out and the target would not have you know, target requirement. For example, the requirement of person who can afford a 10,000 phone as against a requirement of a perfect person who can afford a 50,000 phone is different. So if iPhone would have tried to generalize it, this would have been a problem. And that's why Android actually suffers. So if you see most of this low cost Android, if our requirements are different, we don't, uh, we are not satisfied with it. So for example, uh, uh, Android phone with 7,000 rupees or Android phone of 75,000 rupees, you know, Android is almost similar, but the experience differs, right? And thereby this kind of uh, difference or different models come into market. So whenever you are developing, please see to it that you have a target uh, you know, uh, targeted development where you ta uh, technology can be generic, but your product or your application should be targeted so that your chances of success is high. So if you generalize it, uh, it's one of the pitfalls and uh, th that could actually lead you into trouble. So be very, very careful on targeting it properly. And I'm not talking this in a business sense. I'm talking it in a very technology sense so that your technology is successful. Business is all, all a different game that we are talking about and those inputs uh, should be utilized, but I'm not covering that in this session at least. So uh, yeah, so basically I guess uh, I would like to end my session with this particular note. And if you have any questions, we can take it for next two minutes or else uh, probably uh, organizers will tell us what to do next. Thank you. Participants, if you're having any doubts, you can raise your hands. Okay, I guess there are no more questions. So yeah, then we can end the end end session, I guess. Yeah. Nijisha. Yes, sir. Can you summarize? Ah, okay, sir. Yes. I take this opportunity to thank Mr. Siddharth Nair, CEO, Expinito Biodesigns, for giving a very informative session on the topic product experience and design thinking for wearables for this online FDP on wearable devices. The presentation was well constructed, and I am sure that all the participants could easily follow the presentation and capture all the information that Sir gracefully shared it with us. Beginning with technology rejection, Mr. Siddharth covered the factors associated with the citing various examples. The case studies were educational and uh, design thinking process uh, design thinking process from usability engineering was really educational and the case studies helped us in understanding it better. Sir, I must say your personal experience of the product development, especially the development of uh, your product, which was based on neuromodulation, was amazing and motivational. Sir, we are extremely fortunate to get another interesting talk from you in this FTP. I, on behalf of the organizing committee, would like to thank you for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Have a great day.